Times uh, during COVID, when we're all sitting at home, it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. Today, in the pandemic, we are digitally doing the literature festival, and I think that our audience is not in front of us. We are talking with each other, but we can feel the feeling, the sense of belonging, that thousands of people are connected to us, that we are listening to each other, and that we are connected to each other, and that we are connected to each other, and that we are connected to each other. People who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world, we were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information. On behalf of festival co-directors Namitha Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to the new season of the Jaipur Literature Festival 2021. Given the second wave that has been at the heart of so much pain and suffering, we wish to continue with our vision to ensure the free flow of knowledge and information to address the many vital questions of our times through this series. Presenting today. Fiction as resistance to the unmaking of India. Nantara Segal in conversation with Jayanti Naju Seth. A glimpse into the inspirations and creativity of an outstandingly courageous and eloquent storyteller. Nantara Segal's early memoir, Prison and Chocolate Cake, was first published in 1954. She has written more than 18 books and novels in a career spanning. Over six decades, her life has been marked by idealism and a commitment to her beliefs. She remains a prolific writer with recent novels that include *The Fate of Butterflies* and *When the Moon Shines by Day*. In conversation with Jayanti Naju Seth, Segal examines her writing and the essence of her recent work. Nandar Segal speaks and writes against attacks on the freedom. of expression Jyanti Naju Seth recently retired as the head of the Department of English Jesus and Mary College after a career spanning 40 years she has edited and published two collections of essays on Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice and on Marquis's Chronicle of a Death Foretold respectively do remember all our sessions that have been broadcast till now are available and archived on this site at the Mughal Tent venue Please do remember to ask questions and comments by typing it into the comment box and Jenty will ask this of Nantara at the end of the session. Ladies and gentlemen, fiction as resistance to the unmaking of India. Nantara Sagal in conversation with Jenty Naju Seth. Jenty, over to you. Thank you Sanjay. and welcome such an honor such a privilege and such a pleasure to have you here to talk with us today nantara this is a very lucky day for us thank you so much jayanti it's lovely to meet you thank you so today we are here ostensibly to talk about your two latest books i say ostensibly because i'm nearly certain that we will stray into topics that have to relate to both the past and the future of your writing along with discussing these two books but the books that we are here to look at most closely are when the moon shines by day which you have published in 2017 and the fate of butterflies published in 2019 i understand that you are also involved in writing a lockdown book as they're coming to be known these days which you are in the process currently of penning uh, i'm i am yes i'm writing a new fiction and uh, hopefully it should be finished by the end of the year that is that's really exciting news for your many many fans of whom i must uh, confess that i i feature among them uh, i uh, wanted to say but before we begin a talk on these two books we cannot 
and we should not ignore what has gone before. Your almost formidable output includes at least a dozen works of fiction and almost the same number of non-fiction works. The reason I cannot be more accurate is because you have proved to be the publisher's darling. And since your first memoir, Prison and Chocolate Cake, which was published, in fact, in the year in which I was born, 1954, uh, it, uh, your works have been republished continuously and they're sought after by an increasing number of readers who have swollen in number to become a fan following. Well, <laughs> sorry, yes. I'm not aware of a fan following, but I'm very happy that I'm being read uh, and that the books are continuing to be published. Indeed, it's been a continuous process, I see, uh, with republications very, very often. And reading your last two books, this is no surprise at all, because the elegance of language and the quicksilver twists of plot are evident in these two novellas, as very much in evidence. The last one has just been published in German as well. Well, thank you for telling us that. Uh, that's, that's really, that's good to know. And a real another feather in your cap. But before we come to the style of the novellas, which we will discuss later, I wonder if we could just spend a moment on the content of these works. If you will allow me to separate style from content, which you may or may not feel comfortable doing. Well, having written for decades on the chronicle of the making of modern India, uh, really uh, uh, keeping a sort of a diary of it almost. You now seem to have shifted into, let's say, fifth gear, the overdrive, into the unmaking of modern India. Could you speak to us about the body of your work and the slight bend of direction it has taken of late? Uh, Jayanti, will you permit me to just say a word about why I am what I am. Uh, please, we will, that would be very welcome. Yes, please. Okay, well, you see, I, I grew up to the sights and sounds of revolution because my parents fought for freedom from British rule under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi in that epic struggle for freedom, the nonviolent struggle. And uh, well, my mother served three long prison terms. My father served four long prison terms and he died as a result of his fourth imprisonment. So in Lucknow, I believe. Pardon? In the prison in Lucknow. In the... I, I'm sorry, I was, I was just saying that it was not died. in Allahabad, but in Lucknow that he was imprisoned last. No, he was imprisoned in prison the fourth time in the most uh, dreadful jail in, in Bareilly. Uh, and his health broke down, he had a heart attack, he, his lungs collapsed and he was not released. And finally, when he was released, uh, he died. It was about three weeks after his release that he died because he was just too ill. So that's my general background. And also, you know, in those growing up years, the slogans I heard outside our home were like in Khalab, Zindabad, uh, and other freedom slogans, Hindu, Muslim, Ek, O, for the unity of Hindu and, and Muslims. So all these things have, of course, affected me as a child. I longed to grow up and go to jail as well. Uh, uh, and to fight for freedom. And freedom having been my parents' religion, as it were, uh, it became mine. And, well, what can I say? I have therefore fought for freedom all my life through my writing and also at times through my life. Um, so, Obviously, it has affected my fiction. That's been my material, as it were. 
politics was not something out there. You know, it was in my home, it was in my life. Uh, it was in the conversation we had at table. It was in everything we did. Um, and I have not ever been able to stomach the loss of freedom for myself, for anyone else, or for my country. I've looked upon my earlier novels as having been about the making of modern India, as you said, because it was a remarkable uh, situation where this this country, for the first time in history, uh, put democracy before development. Uh, and other things too, uh, the first in history to give universal suffrage at the making of a nation, all of that. And so these were things which formed the background of my writing. And then came a time here when freedom was being lost and um, things were happening here which had never happened before. We were being shrunk into a, a mono identity uh, called Hindutva and Hinduism. And so my reaction to that came in these two novellas, which I have called the unmaking of modern India. And before that, before I wrote them, I sent a letter to the Sahitya Academy returning my Academy Award and saying that uh, it was not possible for me to keep it because they, the Academy, had ignored the death of an Academy winning writer uh, and earlier two other writers and all three of them had been killed. The Academy had not raised its voice. So I, in fact, coined the phrase the non-making of India or the unmaking of India. And these two novellas that we're going to talk about reflect that. <coughs> Does that explain my background? It does, I think it does for me, it does for our audience as well. You have in fact anticipated the question I was going to ask you next, which was exactly this, that's after you won the Academy, uh, the Sahitya Academy uh, uh, Award, which was one of many, both national and international awards that have come to you, that you did in uh, after writing Rich Like Us in 1985, you returned it in 2015 and that was the very question that I was going to uh, come up with. There's one other novel that I thought if we could just cast a quick glance at which was almost uh, which was near that period in 1988 you had published Mistaken Identity which was again acclaimed worldwide. Uh, it received a lot of attention and a lot of praise because of its light and its accurate touch in dealing with the dark subject matter of Hindu-Muslim unrest. Do you see the two novels that we are going to very soon uh, start discussing, the, the two works of fiction that today we are here to discuss, do you see in any way as they are bringing up to the present day an unresolved problem, at least a century old, which you began to write about in Mistaken Identity? Uh, what is this problem a century old that you're mentioning? Uh, the um, uh, matter of the Hindu and Muslim unrest, the Hindu-Muslim unrest oh, that you... No, you see, um, well, rich like us was my reaction to the emergency of Indira Gandhi, which was in fact, let's call it what it was, a dictatorship. Mistaken identity came to me as a result of Lal Krishna Advani's famous Rath Yatra, which was the forerunner of the destruction of the Babri Masjid. And so there, I was wanting to point out the, the fact of India uh, being a extremely uh, multicultural civilization. And I based this Part of the novel is based in jail, of course, but part of it in Ayodhya, 
yes. the cradle of Hinduism, but where Muslim and Hindu landowners, the great Jagirdars, all lived side by side. They shared a culture. They shared food, music, um, love affairs. I mean, everything, you name it. There was no difference between one and, and the other. So I wanted to make it clear. I made it very clear, in fact, that this was India. Ayodhya, the cradle of Hinduism, reflected this multicultural of ours. Uh, and um, so that was what mistaken identity was about, with uh, uh, the main character, of course, being a, a playboy's son of one of the Rajas. Yes. Uh, the Raja was a, a psychophantic um, chamcha of the British. Um, uh, but Bhushan Singh, the playboy, had no interest in politics. He was more interested in ballroom dancing and his girlfriends. And he was arrested completely by mistake yes. uh, by the British at a time when huge uh, arrests were being made of uh, nationalists and communists who were accused of trying to overthrow the British government. So if we could move now to uh, throw a little light on uh, the, the first of the two novellas, When the Moon Shines by Day, which you published in 2017. Now here we have a story set in a dystopian future, or is it? Is it indeed set it in a future? present, Jayanti. There was no future about it. I wrote Mistaken I. When the Moon Shines by Day, also the one after that, at a time when, of course, the nation was in the state of being turned into a dictatorship, which it still is. But for me, I don't know how to explain this. This situation in India came like a, a bludgeon on me. You know, it was like a blow in the chest. It was, it was something I felt so personally as if it was happening to me. And so these novellas came out of it. And that also accounts for their complete difference in style. Yes, indeed. I was uh, The reason I was asking if it was set in this dystopian future or the present was because uh, it seems to be one step further than what we have witnessed in some of the cases. Uh, the historical works which were dealing with the Mughal period are not explicitly banned in the course of the book, but they are removed from bookshops. Servants who have recognizably Muslim names take on a Hindu persona to go unnoticed in their neighborhoods. That possibly is actually happening and not, not something that you project. That, as that happened in the moon shines by day, if you remember. It is the moon shines by day that I'm that I'm speaking of right now, yes. and and in fact, in the moon shines by day, they have the the art galleries which are considered submersive, sub, subversive, are bombed, and people are under attack. You have the character of Kamlesh, a very interesting character who is a career diplomat with an interest in history, and suddenly he finds himself again almost a mistaken identity, by mistake, being taken for somebody through a book that he writes, he's mistaken for somebody who is pro-war, who is divisionary, who is a part of a fascistic world. And again, uh, rather uh, anticipating perhaps a, a date that hasn't quite come to be yet, he has to answer to the Director of Cultural Transformation, the DCT. Do you see it then as a satirical fantasy or do you think this is actually a glimpse of the future we might be moving towards? No, uh, Jayanti, what I want to emphasize here that it was not about the future. It was about what was happening around us in India at that time. And that's what sort of provoked me almost to... to write about it, put it down on paper. It was not for me a future. 
coming at us. It was there. Okay. Yeah. So the Directorate of Cultural Transformation is perhaps half a step further than actually happened, but I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, Picasso said, fiction is the lie that um, makes you recognize the truth. Truth. Absolutely. That director was not present then, but yes. I saw it uh, as something that was going to happen. Now, in the form of the book club that exists within the uh, novel, you have elegant, very elite class, a uh, very elite class of women who uh, they come from diverse backgrounds. There's a Lily, there's a Rihanna, there is, uh, you know, there's uh, two Hindu uh, names as well. They're co coping in a variety of ways with the reality that confronts them. And yes. the passage I was hoping that uh, you might read, though I, I completely understand when you, you know, think it, that the novels are slim enough to let people read them for themselves and you don't anticipate reading a passage. But I thought that their exchange, uh, perhaps you could just speak a little about their guarded response to what they're surrounded with, considering their, uh, the class to which they belong. Is no. it inadequate? It was... Um not guarded so much as it was not quite happening at the time. You see, they were seeing something happening in India that had not happened before. Uh, the fact, for instance, that uh, the Hindu Hindus are told to have at least five children, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yes. You know, that lives were being controlled in a way that had never happened before. So they are, and when we use the word elite, um, it covers a vast uh, area. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, if when people call me elite, I want to laugh. And I don't think of myself that way. And these women were what one would call well-educated middle-class women in the book, um, all of them doing something which they wanted to do. The husband of one, uh, uh, the husbands were doing different things also. And they just got together for, uh, to form a book club. I never thought of them as being high upper crust or, or you know, in the billionaire class or anything of that kind. Well, they were comfortable and they certainly had the freedom to make choices that perhaps a vast number of people, women in India, don't have the privilege of doing. Well, I mean, that is a whole huge other story. Yes, yes that's true. That does. Uh, the books that they are discussing, uh, one of them uh, remarks about uh, a certain section of the book that is under discussion and says that not realizing what was so plainly going on all around you couldn't happen in real life. But then, of course, this was fiction. I thought that, that sentence sort of leapt off the page at me. And what do you think is what I would like to ask you now? What do you think is the real relationship between social reality and fiction? Do your books seek to record it or alter social and cultural realities? My books <clears throat> do neither of those things. Okay. Uh, as a beginning writer and the writer that I was for many, many years, I was, uh, what I was recording was, as I said, the growth of modern India, which meant what I saw as being a glittering aspiration. India was not a nation that accomplished everything it wanted to. There were endless failures and, and uh, mistakes made. But the aspiration was there. And that was what was inspiring. And what people like me, many, many others of my generation grew up with, which is why they and I can't stomach what is happening now. You know, I was not... Um, I was not aware of um, of um, anything but 
my frame of reference, which I was putting down. And I was the only person putting it down because other writers were choosing, of course, different subjects because they were dealing with different material. I had this close bond, so close that I felt I was married to India. The, my main character has always been India. Right. I know it's not very odd, but you know. Would you agree then that your writing, uh, there are people who've described your writing as literary activism. Would you agree with that description? Very much agree because that is what all writing and all art is about. Art is about activism. Literary writing has been about activism. All writers, all poets have reacted to the loss of freedom of expression always from way back uh, uh, in every country in the world, I think. Uh, when we look at Chile, for example, under Pinochet, there were famous writers of peasant origins, including Neruda, probably right. the most famous of them all, who were absolutely furiously defying the dictatorship through their poetry. And, you know, when the Spanish Civil War was on much before that, an English poet, Stephen Spender, called it the Poets' War because writers and poets had come there to fight for Spain's democracy, which had been attacked. Quite. So when uh, in a review I read, uh, again, uh, referring to When the Moon Shines, uh, it as a very uncomfortable read. Is this what you're aiming for then? A very uncomfortable read. A very uncomfortable read. Yes, that it makes the reader uncomfortable with the... Yeah, but the, all, all uh, books uh, which are fighting for freedom make a very uncomfortable read uh, because it's a terrible position to be in. I mean, I can't think offhand of titles. Well, what comes to mind is when the be uh, for whom the bell tolls, Ernest Hemingway. Yes. Books like that, you know, they they don't. Um, they're not happy books. They are very deeply unhappy and disturbed books, and they are there to disturb the reader because of what is happening and what the book is writing about. Well, a possible solution, which I think may, um, I may perhaps be exaggerating the importance you give it, again, from the very same book we are discussing, is a reference you make to a painting which has a very impoverished man under a large loaf of bread. And you have the, the painter explaining uh, Gandhi's much quoted saying that for the poor man, God is a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread. So I was, I, I thought to ask you that do you think that the answer then, because you've certainly given us a realistic and more than realistic portrait, is the, does the answer lie in a reversion to Gandhi's teaching, to Gandhiism? Is that where the answers would be? Well, let us look at what happened. Gandhi taught us the meaning of true religion. Mm -hmm. He taught us the meaning of true economics, true politics, because he said any policy, economic, political, whatever, has to be judged by whether it benefits the last and the least. He was the first man on earth to say that. He was neither a, uh, an economist nor a, a politician. And for him, the Vaishnav, which I well define it as the virtuous person, is the one who feels the pain of others. Jo peeda parai jani re, that was Gandhi. So yes, we don't have to go back to him. We have to move forward to him and all that he represented. Okay. 
I found the most chilling line in this in this particular book was when the uh, German who has been recording the history of revolutions when he says my country's past is the future of yours which I, was the german was aware of what was happening in india right and, and i wanted to ask you that do you think that at any level this is actually the case that the that the past of germany is the future of india it looks like being the future of the world at yes, this does that look at all the dictatorships that have arisen around yes. the world okay that is okay since since we have uh, constraints of time i thought if we could look uh, at the last of your published works the fate of butterflies which you published in 2019 so that would be just before all the lockdowns happened and the pandemic really took hold etc uh there is the parallels with nazi germany what we've just been speaking about uh, in in when discussing the previous novel the parallels are much more overt with nazi germany in the fate of butterflies but it's a book that's also about the power of writing prabhakar who is the main character has and he has a harrowing personal history he writes a book which is completely misunderstood by some of his readers it is taken as a neo fascist uh, text he's welcomed into a circle of indian nris i must say i had to suppress a smile over there not not <laughs> in local indian but in indian nris and your Euro european neo fascists who yes. take him as one of them that's right <laughs> now against the bizarre background of their meetings where they welcome him really there is the culture and the civility and you know the peace of the gay couple who run a breakfast outlet called bonjour that's right and that that was uh, uh, as i was very taken by the portrait of the women in, in the previous novel the women and their reading clubs i thought that the uh, the way that bonjour is described and the relationship between the couple and their relationship with the others who visit their bonjour was very very interesting because the clash between the two worlds is very extreme and the clash is inevitable in the physical form it takes so these are the two scenes that i really was hoping that our audience would have a chance uh, if they've already read the book great we referring to them but otherwise all those who will now read the book these are your counterpoint if you will allow me to use that word to the ugliness of modernized india modernized i'm saying very much in inverted commas this book seems to me and please comment on on what i'm saying now uh, it seems even more passionately and personally felt than the last book absolutely janti uh, can i say a word about its style please, please. and in fact that in fact applies to the style of the moon shines by day and also to the one i'm writing now but you see i call it a novella i call these novellas now they uh, what i have written is not a long short story uh, it's not a mm -hmm. long short stories no um you know because a, a novella is called a long short story where they're not that and they are not short novels either they're not either of those things the what they are uh, and this is not by planning i'm not a planner what they have emerged as being is that they're written in a kind of condensation so that i'm saying in one line or in a paragraph what otherwise would normally be said in a whole page it has condensed itself to um produce an impact immediately you know yes. uh, and as i said earlier i felt i was being nudged by what was happening to indians in india 
and the style reflects that a sort of okay this is very interesting is that how you chose this particular yes. genre well uh, i think that explains the style of both the novellas mm -hmm. and the one that i'm now working on well we would love a glimpse into that but i'm not sure if you would if you would be willing to do that to, to today or oh, not it is it is like the other two about the unmaking of india right right and in this in 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 the book that we are currently discussing in uh, the the butterflies this is a portrait of the last of our freedoms our personal freedoms our sexual freedoms our religious even our culinary freedoms being slip, slipping away and clearly you are not willing to let They're that happen chipping, without a comment they are not chipping away they are hacking away it's okay. happening like that bludgeoning there's nothing gradual about it anymore there was it started that way in the moon shines by day yes but it is now uh, very clear uh, that uh, that's what's happening you know there's no two ways about it and this isn't just about india from what you have written and what you have said this evening this is about the world isn't it well and we've seen it happening all over europe uh, at one time uh, franco in spain uh, pinochet in chile uh, and of course let's not forget soviet russia under stalin and the greatest example of all is nazi germany so it's been happening for a long time the change is that we are now getting elected dictators mm. elected dictatorships which continue for some very strange reason to call themselves democracies uh, i now call india the world's largest autocracy all right now that's that is a statement that will take some digesting because it is it hasn't really been stated in just those terms so far that i know of and from again just to put it in the global perspective is it are we turning away i i understand that all this the cases you mentioned have to do with what was happening in the 20th century in across europe but there were ideals that were fought for in the 20th century do you see the 21st century as a radical departure from, from the hunt for those ideals yes there's an uh, there, it's not a departure from that it's a it's a complete change you know it's the difference between black and white that now mm -hmm. truth uh, is uh, is not there you know it, it it is lies that are being told there is a sharp difference uh, between uh, what we used to think of as good and evil we knew the difference now you know evil is uh, predominant evil things are happening and that's now taken for granted i mean look we are what i call in a dance of death today in india okay thousands are dying for lack of treatment thousands of dead bodies are lying around with no way to bury them I mean, if you think of hell on earth, you can't find a better description. Alongside of that is the murder of democracy is proceeding under cover of COVID, and alongside. So, you know, there are two dances of death as I see them. The second one being the murder of democracy. and is this a global loss a uniform global loss that you see or is it departure to the radical right as one used to think of the radical right this is a whole new evil monstrous situation the like of which has not been seen 
in India before. Well, in the uh, Fate of Butterflies, you have a character, uh, Katrina, and she refuses to be silenced. She equally refuses to cover although, up physically her wounds. Although she has been gang raped. Yes, she's been gang raped and she's and been, she's got her. wounds all over her body, which she refuses to uh, cover she, up with clothes. She is, she, is she your objective correlative in T.S. Eliot's terms in the novel? Is, is, she, is she you? Do you feel the same way that you refuse to be silenced and that you refuse to cover up for wounds that you may have perceived? That is correct, but I, I will not confine it to me. Right. All over India, we're watching it happen. Poets are being arrested, who will not keep silent. All over Malayali, Bengali, Urdu, Hindi, poets are either in jail or being persecuted. Murugan, as you know, was persecuted. Writers are being killed. Uh, so this is not me. This is about art. That is why dictators are always afraid of art, because it doesn't shut up. It says what it has to say, because that is what writers do. That is what writers do. I want to make a special uh, salute to those who are writing today, whether poetry, non-fiction, fiction, whatever, and other kinds of activism from young people, uh, for example, Krishna uh, Kanaya Kumar, uh, Muslim women, as in Shaheen Bag, civil servants, lawyers, these people are not keeping quiet. I have the greatest admiration for these uprisings all over India. They are not confined to writing or mine. Quite the opposite of what you have just stated is that most chilling uh, uh, sentence in the entire uh, book is the, the judge's pronouncement. He says, a most about the rape and the gang rape of uh, the Muslim women. He says, a most unfortunate event, most condemnable, the work of an unknown miscreant, best always, forgotten. Always, nobody committed a murder. Nobody gang raped anybody. These things are, well, they happened, you know. That, well, that's the attitude of the government today. No well, one is responsible. If we can then take it to its logical conclusion, uh, would you say that there is nothing to alleviate this feeling of doom? You know, it moves beyond gloom to absolute doom. And was that your intention? Or is nothing. there the alternative of dancing? <laughs> Let's face the music and dance. Let's face the music and dance. What the character says in uh, the fate of butterflies, and I took it out of a, yes. I think, ninety six Hollywood movie, right. in which Fred Astaire sings the song. There may be trouble ahead, but while there's moonlight and music and love and romance, let's face the music and dance. That's a lovely line to end with. Thank you so very very much for speaking with us today. Jenti said, Nantara Cycle, thank you so much for this absolutely brilliant conversation, Nantara. More power to you. Let's face the music and dance. And like you said, Gandhi's whole concept of his economic concept, his concept around religion, all of that has come back a full circle almost 75 years after India's independence. More power to you and your pen for what you've been doing, speaking up for artists and artisans across the country. You've done so unflinchingly, despite everything that's been thrown at you over so many decades. Continue to do so. And thank you both so much for this conversation. Thank you all for listening uh, to us. And I do hope you're going to continue to stay logged on to the Jaipur Literature Festival in the coming weeks. As you all know, this grave repercussion of COVID-19 has set us back 
in many ways that we could not have imagined. In our efforts to rebuild the devastating impact suffered by the arts sector, Teamwork Arts launched Art Matters to help over 5,200 artists and craftspeople in need across the country. With the onset of this virulent second wave, we once again face an unprecedented and heartbreaking challenge where we need to rush medical resources as well as food to artisans and artists in different parts of India. We've launched an emergency fund to be able to provide for this. If you can, please contribute by pressing the contribute button. On behalf of all of us, stay safe, stay double masked. Remember to rejoin us on Friday, the 28th of May with our new sessions. Neither settler nor native, Mahmood Mamdani in conversation with Pardis Madhavi, born a Muslim, the population myth, S.Y. Qureshi and Ghazala Wahab in conversation with Pragya Tiwari, which is at 8.30 p.m. Thank you, stay safe, stay double masked. times uh, during COVID when we're all sitting at home, it's, it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. In the pandemic, we are digitally literature festival and I think that we are not in front of us, we are talking about it. But we can feel that feel, that we are connected to that thousands of thousands of people who are connected to us. People who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world. We were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information.